Bedtime was a comforting ritual for most little kids, but not for me. Not only would most children protest that it was too early to go to bed and they still wanted to watch a movie or play video games, my own youthful evenings were fraught with fear. A fear that still resides in some dark corner of my mind. As a scientist, I can't prove that what happened was real, but I know I was scared out of my mind, and I'm pretty sure I have never been that scared before or since. I studied my notes and I'd like to give my account of the event. I don't remember exactly when, but I started being afraid to go to bed after my parents moved me into my own room. This was when I was eight, I had been sharing a room with my older brother, and understandably he wanted some privacy. I had to get used to sleeping in the small, dark room at the back of the house on my own. The room was small and narrow, but weirdly long. There was only enough room for a single bed and two dressers, one on either side. I didn't begrudge my parents for that, though. Even at eight, I understood how modest our house was and quickly internalized that it meant real loving folks. I had a really happy and loving childhood. There was one window that faced the back garden, nothing special, but even at midday, the light that came into the room was weak. When my brother got his new bed, one that was just for him and normal and smelled fresh, I got the bunk air mattresses for the bunk bed we used to share. I was a little bit sad that I wouldn't be able to share a room with him anymore, but I was excited about getting to sleep on the top bunk. It had always seemed like a fun place to sleep, just like a big shelf in the sky. The first night I was in my room, I was sitting on the top bunk, looking down at my action figures and cars, when it seemed to me as though something was going on down on the bottom bunk. Even though it was silent and I was playing with my toys, I couldn't stop staring down at the lower bunk as though I thought I had seen movement. The bunk bed was empty, the bed made neatly with the dark blue blanket tucked in and two white pillows per bunk. I didn't really think much of it at the time, I was just a kid. I like the comfort of my parents' voices coming from the living room as I was lying in bed. Tired from the day, I went to bed. If you wake up because you think you hear something, it may take a few seconds for you to realize what's happening. You might still be half asleep, rubbing your eyes and ears, trying to get a clear picture. Something just moved. I squinted in the blackness, realizing I could see the outline of the small room I was in. There was a bit of light coming in through the window. I realized my parents had gone to bed, and a moment later, so did I, at the same time as it dawned on me what the sound was, as had now fully entered my mind. I woke up and listened again, and it sounded like someone was pulling the bedsheets off the bed. I threw off my covers and ran back the way I'd come. That was all it was, just the bedsheets moving. I lay there in a silence so complete I found myself questioning whether or not I had heard anything at all. I thought it was either my mind playing tricks on me, or perhaps the cat had jumped up onto the bottom bunk. However, as I thought more about it, I realized that my bedroom door was still closed. Maybe my mom had looked in there at some point, and the cat had gotten in then. It had to be. That was the only thing that made sense. I turned and faced the wall, closing my eyes. As I did so, I shifted my weight and the rustling under me abruptly stopped. At first I thought I had just moved my cat, who frequently slept at the foot of my bed, but it quickly became obvious the occupant of the bottom bunk was not my normally feline-scaled bed partner. And then the guy seemed to wake up or something because all of a sudden the empty bed started thrashing around like a little kid having a fit. I saw the blankets hiking up and down and back and forth. I started to get scared, not nervous, but actually scared. I couldn't seem to move, my heart was thumping in my chest, and I looked around the room. I yelled out, a loud high-pitched noise, and felt a surge of panic wash over me, my heart beginning to pound. The room filled with the sound of the patient thrashing in the bed, the blanket bouncing and billowing, hilly and then flat like a giant white sheet breaking into waves. I felt an adrenaline rush and my feet felt glued to the floor. Like most young boys, I yelled for my mom. I heard her getting up and started to feel better. Suddenly the bunk bed started shaking violently and I heard the sheets down below rustling around. 
There was no way I was jumping down for fear that the thing would reach out and grab me, pulling me into the bottom bunk. So I stayed where I was, holding my blanket over my head and waiting. Finally, the door opened and light came in. I felt a sense of relief. I noticed the bottom bunk below me was empty and the sheets were smooth and undisturbed from the washing. I cried and my mom comforted me. Tears of fear were quickly replaced with happy ones. I didn't say anything to my mom about the bunk because I felt like that's where the strange man who had stayed in the cabin was going to come back to, and just simply appearing to speak about it, or even whisper about it, might have been an indication to the contrary. I don't know. I was a kid. All I can say is that I felt like the invisible person was still in proximity and could overhear me. My mom agreed to stay up in the guest room and stay with her until the morning. I eventually calmed down and put myself to bed, although I didn't sleep much and kept waking up to the sound of the bed sheets moving as she rolled over. I remember the next day, it was a Saturday. I was just glad to get out of that stuffy little room and went out to play with my friends in the huge backyard we had. We were lucky, the backyard was quite long and sloped downwards with plenty of trees and shrubs. We had lots of good hiding spots out there. There was a sycamore tree as well, with large wide branches we climbed and played on. It was our own private little forest back there. Despite the activities, I would often look over at the small window. It was so narrow, but to me it felt like a one-way mirror into some hellish, winter-only place of fear. Outside there was our bright green garden, filled with my co-workers and friends and I felt an irrational fear that someone in that room was watching me play and waiting for me to be alone with her. It might sound weird to you, but when my parents rousted me back into that room for the night, I just went and did it. Didn't argue or try to talk my way out of it. I silently walked in, climbed the ladder to the top bunk, and lay down. If I became an adult, I'd be keen to tell anyone who had time to listen. But even at that age, I knew enough not to talk about something I couldn't prove existed. However, that isn't really the point. The more important part was, I knew this thing didn't want me to mention it. It's funny how certain words you just completely blank on, honestly. I mean, it happened the second night, to me, lying there in the dark, worried for no particular reason, just feeling like the atmosphere had changed somehow, become thick, heavy. I distinctly remember hearing the first little rustle of someone getting into the bed below and having my heart jump. I realized someone was coming back to the bottom bunk. It was like the word had been completely blotted from my memory and suddenly it fought its way up from the depths and I thought, really? How could I forget the word for that? Ghost, someone said. It's amazing to me how much something as intangible as a ghost can give someone the willies. The dark seemed to lean in when it was spoken aloud. The room was alight with silent implications. It was right then when I realized my left-hand man had stopped moving. The bedsheets were still and undisturbed, but I knew he was breathing, in a slow, wheezy, rattling sort of way. I could imagine his chest slowly rising, then falling again on each breath. I shuddered and hoped with all my might that whatever it was would just leave us alone. The house was still dark and silent, just like the night before. I could hear my roommate breathing heavily in his bed. I was so scared I could hardly move. I just wanted this thing to leave so I could relax. What did it want? Then something really scary happened. It moved. It moved differently than before. When it was thrashing around in the bottom bunk, it was fast and violent, with no real direction. It looked almost just like a person throwing a tantrum to hear Rold tell it. This new movement was slow, methodical, and looked purposeful. The thing, whatever it was, had sat up. The heavy breathing was loud enough now that I could hear it, after a few moments, and once again it sounded almost like a person trying to catch their breath after running a short distance. I just lay there, crying silently. I was scared more scared than I could ever convey to you or anyone else. I couldn't believe it when I realized the depth of my fear could indeed grow. I can't imagine what the thing under my bed would look like, 
when was the last time it saw me awake? I soon found out as it began to explore the wooden slats which held up my mattress, running what I assumed to be fingers and hands all along them with a surprising gentleness, considering a few minutes ago I could feel and hear it hitting them. And just then, with a sudden jerk, it poked quickly between two slats and jabbed the mattress. I felt it through my padding and winced, letting out a small scream. The person in the bunk below me started kicking and shaking the bunk like before, and bits of paint flaked down in a dull white carpet on top of my blanket from the bed frame scraping against the wall. I was back in the warm light, and my mother was there. She gave me a big hug and comforting words, which gradually calmed me down. She asked what was wrong, but I couldn't tell her, I just kept repeating one word. It was a nightmare, I said. This went on for weeks, maybe even months. Every night I would be woken up by the sound of the sheets rustling. I would scream and push the intruder away, not allowing it to get in the bed and feel me up. The bed would shake back and forth violently, usually until my mom came in, then she would finish the night in the bottom bunk completely obliviously. Over the next few weeks, possibly a couple of months, I managed to fake sickness a few times, making up various dishonest reasons to hang out in my parents' bedroom. But more often than not, I was left alone in the early hours of the morning in that room, with the outside light casting weird shadows, by myself, with that thing. As time went on, I guess I got used to the grotesque scene, because I figured out that my mom being there made some kind of barrier to protect me. The thing couldn't touch me. It would be the same if my dad had been awake, I'm sure. Things surrounding him always put me to the back of my mind. By this time, I was used to seeing the creature every night. I wouldn't say we were friends, but my antipathy towards it had certainly mellowed with time. I was still terrified of it, though, and had a palpable sense of what it was capable of and what it might do every time I saw it. It seemed to despise me, yet was almost certainly sexually attracted to me, in its own unique way. The cold weather came and did what I feared most by shortening the days. I was sure the ghoul was happy to have more time in the evening to do what it did without being noticed. My family was less present at home. My grandma, who had been so compassionate and caring her entire life after grandpa died, had fallen to dementia. She had such a sharp memory her whole life, and now I watched her slowly lose her memories, like they were being stolen one by one from a safe in her mind, until she couldn't even recognize her own family. Mom fought the fight the best she could to keep Grandma where she knew her surroundings. But the progression of the disease and the stereotype of the special care required were unbeatable. The truth was clear to us all of a sudden. She could no longer live alone in her house, and we had to put her in a care home. My grandmother had a bad string of nights, and my mom finally didn't go out to stay with her. It seemed she had had enough nights like the one described that made her make up her mind. She was going to stay with my grandmother. I adored my grandmother, and the thought of her so unwell filled me with dismay. Although I would be lying if I said I didn't feel a little twinge of guilt amid the sadness as well. I had gotten used to my mom not being at home during the night and felt that she was the only thing keeping me safe from whatever was happening during the night. That afternoon, when I got home from school, I wasted no time getting to work. I ran inside and got to work pulling the sheets off of the bed and pulling the mattress off the lower bunk so I could pull all the wooden slats out. I dragged an old desk, an old chest of drawers, some chairs out of storage, and converted the bottom bunk area into a cubby space. I told my dad I was making an office, and he chuckled and patted me on the head. I was determined not to give her another place to sleep for God knows how long. By the time it got dark, I was lying in bed, still feeling upset and worried about my mother. I didn't know what to do, but I felt I had to see it for myself. I pulled open my mom's jewelry box and took out a small silver crucifix I had seen in there before. Our family never went to church or anything, and my parents weren't really religious, but I had always believed in a higher power. I clung to the hope that the crucifix might protect me should the unseen and unknown threat come back that night. Despite my fear and my continued anxiety, 
I managed to fall asleep and wake up in the morning without any incidents, only to look back on that night as one of the worst of my entire life. I shook my head and rubbed my eyes. The room was pitch black again. I was able to make out the shape of the window, the door, the walls, and shelf with toys on it that looked much less like sinister-looking figures in the dark. I guess what bothered me the most was the silence. I mean complete silence, no one talking, no one snoring, no sheets rustling, no house creaking. It was a home, still, but not empty. I shiver to this day even thinking about it. The thing, the nightly invader, wasn't downstairs in the bottom bunk, it was in my bed. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I lay there dumbly, refusing to acknowledge the situation, opting instead to feign sleep. I hadn't seen the thing yet, I could only feel it under the blanket as I brushed my hand over top. It looked like it was still there, there was an outline in the fabric. I was too scared to look down yet. I remembered it feeling heavy and staying for a long time before, despite the exaggerated time frame, I was sure my memory was accurate. I laid there and lay there, not moving an inch in the dark a scared, helpless child. During the winter months, the days became shorter than the nights, and I remember thinking it would be forever until the sun would rise. It felt like it was that long away. I was shy by nature and would normally have been the last person to initiate such a conversation. But there comes a time when you can't contain such profoundly disturbing behavior any longer. I requested a cross, and of all things, the nurse came back in a moment later with a complete set of bandages, clean and still in the wrapping. I was eager to get out of there and back to my own bed. I tried to remember everything that had happened, and eventually, I recalled the cross. I looked under the pillow, and my hand was there as expected. I checked as safely as possible, trying to make the least noise and be the least obvious about it that I could. But there was no cross. I had either knocked it down behind the bed in my thrashing, or, God forbid, someone had and it right out of my hand. Without the crucifix, I felt my chances of survival drop dramatically. I was too young to understand I was going to die eventually, but I had the distinct impression that if I stayed put, I'd soon be dead, and I needed to get out. I needed to get out of the room somehow, but wasn't sure if I should jump out of the bed and hope I landed on my feet and could run for it, or if I should carefully climb down the ladder and hope I didn't wake up the person sharing the room with me. Noticing the figure hadn't moved while I had shifted around looking for the crucifix, my mind started to wander. Wondering if it was asleep? The figure had stayed perfectly still for a few minutes after I woke up and saw it. It must have assumed it had caught me unawares, gotten eye me at last. I had given up. Or maybe it was just playing one of its sick games again, and it was really wasting my time. Now that I was stuck, I couldn't move, and my mom was in the other room. It probably wanted to savor the last few moments before it got what it wanted. As I lay there, attempting to regulate my breathing to the least noticeable amount, I didn't want to make any noise to give away my position. I took a deep breath, slowly but surely, and with all the courage I could muster, started to inch the blanket away from myself. I reached over the edge of the bed with my right hand and began to pull the blanket a little so I could see my stalker. I didn't need to see with my eyes, as I quickly felt with my hand the unmistakable sensation of another hand, cold and stiff. I froze, holding my breath, sure I was caught. I had stopped taking deep, slow breaths, and my heart rate was up, so it was obvious I wasn't asleep anymore. Tensing, I stayed still, not daring to breathe, sure I had been found out. The person stopped breathing at the normal rate as well, my pulse racing now that they were clearly awake again. It didn't move, and when I touched it, it felt dead. I hesitated, then put my hand lower on the blanket, feeling a tiny forearm, and kept moving my hand further down to find a huge, muscular bicep. The arm was lying out across my chest, with the hand resting on my left shoulder, as though it had grabbed me in my sleep. I'd have to move the dead arm to get it off me. This was not a good idea. I stopped mid-gesture, my heart pounding, 
my mouth going dry as I pulled my hand away, not wanting to touch the stained, greasy fabric. My hand hovered. I was a bit shaky, and I didn't want to actually touch it, but I was curious what the texture was. I left it alone. I still wonder what it would have felt like. I held my hand over it and considered touching it, but I decided not to, for some reason. I walked away without touching it. Still, what did it feel like? Then it moved. The thing moved, but it didn't let go of me. It just reached around my shoulder and pulled me in tighter. I wanted to cry, but was unable to. It slowly shifted its body and arm, or whatever appendage it was, around the other side of me, so that I was pressed against the wall with my back, lying on the bed. This was now the translation of weirdest thing I had experienced in this cramped little space. I was starting to realize how it's strange this thing was not actually forcing its gross hug onto me, but had a little arm that stuck out like a spider from the wall and was pulling me closer. Suddenly, its grasp went from a slow squeeze to a firm pull, and it started tugging and pulling harder at my clothes, as if it realized it didn't have much time left. I struggled for all I was worth, but the thing was much stronger than me. From above, its head, covered by the blanket, looked twisted and wrong, and I soon realized why. It was pulling me in. I tried to shout for help, and all at once my voice broke free, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs but nobody came. That's when I noticed why it had been so desperate to attack just now, why it had been in such a hurry to get me. Out my window, it was just starting to get light out, and seeing this gave me a bit of a morale boost. I struggled with new determination, knowing that if I just kept it pinned down for a little while longer, the thing would have to go back into hiding again. As I fought for my life and sanity, the unnatural parasite shifted its position on top of me, working its way up my chest, its head now poking out from under the blanket, while it wheezed and coughed and hacked to itself. I don't remember what it looked like, I just remember its stale, frigid breath on my face. As the sun came up over the horizon, the formerly dark room that everyone complained about being locked in started to brighten up with the morning sunlight. I blacked out as it choked me out, cutting off my air and compressing my chest. I woke up to the smell of bacon cooking downstairs and saw my dad had returned, which was a relief. After what I had gone through, I figured every day was a bonus at this point. I pulled the bed away from the wall, saying a little prayer of thanks. No more barricading it now, apparently, I had conformed to its preferences. I had not expected it to be my bed or me, for that matter, that went without saying. Weeks went by as staff came and went, and something happened one particularly cold evening that woke me up. I suddenly sat up in bed as the room filled with loud banging noises as if someone was shaking the bunk beds. Then it stopped, and I felt the bed shudder a bit. I listened and thought I could hear a low, drawn-out, rasping breath from the back corner of the building. I've never told anyone about this before. I still get chills when I hear bed sheets rustling at night or a slight wheeze when someone has a cold. And I don't like my bed to share a wall. You may call it superstition, but as I've mentioned, I can't rule out natural causes such as sleep paralysis, a vivid hallucination, or just my overactive imagination. But what I do know is this. A year later, I was moved to a larger room on the opposite side of the building and my parents took the enigmatic, airless, elongated room and converted it into their bedroom. They said it was all they needed. Just enough room for a bed and some personal items. For ten long days, I couldn't get the image out of my head. On the eleventh day, to be safe, we moved the unit. After writing out the details of an incident from my childhood where a man tried to abduct me, I got a lot of supportive messages from people suggesting I write out the rest. I wasn't sure, and I have had trouble sleeping since, but I'm still not sure if I believe it. So here is what I wrote. This one's a bit shorter, only a couple days worth, so I'll see what I can do with it. After that uninvited break-in, if you'll recall, I moved to a different room about a year later. This one was a lot bigger and more comfortable, for sure. You know, some spaces just have bad vibes. Unlike the old one, I never got any weird feelings from this room. 
Thankfully, I got a regular old bed again, instead of the one piece of shit one that had been taken apart and thrown out. The new room was huge, and I had enough space for all my toys. I could have friends over to visit and hang out. Best of all, I was happy to be away from that old creepy part of the house. The first night back at home, I slept through the night. I even moved my bed a few feet from the wall that night. I told my mom that it was because me and my friends liked to play hide-and-seek in the space between. It was a good spot, so that's where we would usually hide. I woke up the next day feeling good, as I laid there for a while, watching my favorite cartoons on the little portable TV. I realized something weird. My old brown armchair that was sitting at the foot of my bed, so faded and frayed from before my time when it was given to us by my aunt, was facing me. It seemed strange when I fell asleep it had been facing the other way. It wasn't like it was a stranger position for it to be in, but I just figured one of my parents had moved it looking for something while I slept, probably something from back when the rooms were different. The second night was less eventful. It was around 11 p.m. and I could hear my parents' TV from the other side of the house. My room was dark, except for the occasional splash of orange which would flicker across the walls from the streetlights outside. I was lying on my bed and feeling pretty good when I thought I heard something. I thought I was breathing at first. The sound was almost imperceptible, like exhaling and inhaling, but I looked around my dark room in the intermittent orange streetlight glow and I could see it. It was hard to see, but when I looked I could see it, and it was definitely the sound of someone else breathing. I even stopped and held my breath for a minute, and they kept going. I laid there in the dark, but despite being sufficiently shaken from the previous bedroom horrors, I did not feel afraid. It had some explanation to the girl upstairs in room 5. This breathing was so quiet and not even close to resembling the labored wheezing I had observed from the monstrosity in the wall, I felt sure it was in my mind. Still, I wasn't taking any chances. I got out of bed carefully and walked over to the light switch, turned it on. The sound vanished instantly. I looked at the old armchair across from my bed. It faced me. Its fabric was old and worn, and it was too close to where I slept for my comfort. I walked over to it and turned it around. I don't know why. It just felt like the right thing to do. Oxy's subconscious mind recoiled at the sight of it like that. By the third night, I didn't feel so brave. I woke up wrapped in the night as usual and lay there staring up at the ceiling, watching the soft orange glow from the streetlight outside. The tree beside the house was swaying slightly in the breeze, casting shadows on the wall that looked pretty cool. Surrounded by the quiet sounds of the city at night, I could hear nothing but the distant buzz of traffic. After a while, I started to drift back to sleep. Then I heard it. My bed frame creaked distinctively at the foot of the bed, as though someone were stirring or just shifting their weight. Looking around, I didn't see anything weird. Everything looked the same as it had all day. I looked around the room, at the comics on the floor, the cardboard boxes, the big armchair, which was still turned away from my bed. Fully awake, I looked at the TV, thinking about turning it on. My older brother's room was right next to mine, and although it was late, he had ears like a bat and would definitely hear it and come in to tell me to turn it off. I sat up, heard it again, crickle crook, and another smaller noise, looked around the room. The dim light coming through my window and the overlaying orange light from the morning sun made shapes that I imagined in my half-awake state. I didn't see anything that worried me. I looked at the chair at the end of my bed. It looked like a normal chair. Sometimes your mind just needs a moment to catch up, you know? This is a gradual process of realizing what you're seeing. Yes, I was looking at that old armchair over there in the shade, but I was really looking at the person in it. In the dim light, I could just make out the top of the entity's head behind the back of the chair. I stood and stared, hoping against hope that my eyes were betraying me that I just wasn't seeing properly in the dark. The creak of the wooden chair as it settled back down made my heart sink. The figure then leaned to the side, I suppose to peer at McMurphy better. Though there it mostly blended into the darkness of the room, 
and I could just make out the long shape of fingers on the chair edge, followed by another. The room was getting quieter and quieter. I could hear the figure quietly shuffling in the chair. First I could just see its forehead, but it kept coming closer until I could see its eyes. The monster was staring at me. It didn't look away. I called for my brother and mom, who came running to my room. They flicked on the light and asked if I had another nightmare. I was sitting in bed staring at the armchair by this point. I was in that small room for a few days before we left. The nights passed without incident, as far as I could see. However, on my last night, I was sleeping in the bed and felt a warm breath against my ear. I sat upright and flicked on the light, but there was no one in there with me. I left quickly and slept on the couch in the living room. Two years had gone by, and I was now sleeping soundly in my bed in our new house. I hadn't had any unusual experiences and was fairly certain I was in the clear after whatever had happened in the other house. After two years of peace, I was feeling pretty comfortable. Finally, my last day arrived, and I had a parting present from my ghostly roommate. The figure in the armchair and the one in the long room had one last joke. Like a dog pissing everywhere, they wanted to make it clear that they could influence me outside the house. I felt their presence again in that moment. I was asleep, two years later, and had a terrible dream. I woke up, to my relief, I was in my own bed. The room seemed darker than I remembered. I let out a huge sigh of relief. But it was so dark that I couldn't see enough to make out my room and everything in it. Shadows were motionless, thick and dense, like they were watching me. The darkness was so black, I could barely make anything out. Still in the complete dark for some reason, I chuckled to myself, realizing I must have pulled the blanket over my head in my sleep. It felt nice and cold on my face compared to the sweltering room. I went to pull it off to take a deep breath of cool air, but stopped when I heard the noise again. The sound of the guard at the foot of my bed breathing would come and go in the room. I lay there, not moving, as the air pressure changed with every breath. I felt really scared for a minute, and then kind of mad, and then I felt really bummed out. Couldn't a guy just be alone for a while? It was just so unexpected, I decided to go and have a talk with it. Maybe it didn't realize it was scaring the crap out of me. I mean, it was just a little kid, not a monster or anything. I felt myself tear up, crying as the breathing got harder and harder, closer and closer. I could feel its breath on the blanket above me. Through my tears, I managed to get out two words, which I hoped would put a stop to this. An hour later, I said, stop. The breathing changed, became more hurried, and I could hear something nearby me just walking or passing through. Then the breathing moved, first out to the end of my bed, and I could hear it walking, slowly, towards the end of the room. It passed through the door and into the dark hallway. I heard it get quieter with each step, then not at all. Amidst heavy breathing and footfalls, I couldn't help but feel distressed, and at the same time, unreasonably happy as I lay there in the dark alone. I had put a pillow on my face. Maybe some people think this is a win, but I don't. Now I know they were walking around close to me and breathing hard, and I can tell you for sure they are not good people. I've always been loath to use this word, but I guess they are essentially evil. I certainly hope I will never see enough of what they are doing to be able to confirm that. How do I know that? Let me explain. Just after it left, I felt a weight on top of me and the blanket got pulled off me harshly. I saw a large hand pushing the blanket down over me and tucking it around my head. In a panic, I climbed around to the side of the bed and ran out of my room, screaming my head off, waking up my family. Make no mistake, the thing in the closet tried to smother me, to strangle me. A few days ago, I had told you two sad stories from my childhood. I'd read them and told you to do the same. I hadn't finished talking. I just sat there stupidly thinking, what if telling you what happened brought all those things back somehow? With no explanation or apology, I eventually got on with things. I left home and reached adulthood under the unwavering banners of science and reason, 
jettisoning my fears and asserting my lived experience over those unsettling memories by sharing them with everyone. To strip them of their power, in essence. Those were just the imaginings of a disturbed child I had rationalized. My skepticism and rationality define me. That's who I am. However, I have to say that the tangible, unexplainable evidence I encountered this morning has me puzzled. I don't know how else to account for that. I find it interesting, at least, that my apprehensions and string of bad luck have persisted after speaking of this for the first time. So much so that I can't rely on normal explanations anymore. Since telling you about my childhood, I just feel weird, I guess. At first I thought it was maybe just because it was kind of intense and scary to talk about, but now it doesn't really seem like that. It feels like someone just snapped a heavy wet blanket over my head and now the sky is a bleak shade of this ends in disaster. I did manage to fall asleep anyway, although I never felt well rested. In the morning I felt like I had been napped once or twice and was under the continual effects of sleep deprivation. The first night was uneventful, no ghostly visitors, no uninvited bedfellows, no asthmatics trapped in the walls of my bedroom. But I had a strange feeling, a deja vu, that I wasn't alone. I mean sure, there wasn't anyone in there that I could see or hear or smell, and I never felt anything like a cold spot or heard voices or unexplained noises like I said. But I just had a feeling during the day, and especially at night, like a wind-up draft in a subway tunnel before a train arrives. Sometimes I noticed it for a moment before something weird happened. I could tell awkwardly that I was starting to feel guilty about something the longer I was there. I tried to keep myself busy with a ridiculous amount of writing projects, reading anything and everything, hoping to fill my head with other stories, to keep it out of the dark places where it obviously liked to go. But no matter what I did, those thoughts always got back in. My anxiety got really bad and I knew I needed to do something about it. I had been studying psychology in university, and one of the things I learned is that anxiety often comes from a feeling of helplessness. People feel anxious when they feel like they can't control anything. The best antidote is to empower yourself. It seemed drastic, but I decided to go back to the house and confront those memories and prove to myself that they were just that. Memories. There was nothing actually wrong with it. The drive back to my old house was uneventful, and I felt a lot better now. I was in control and felt happy and content. I was driving out to confront the place I had thought was a monster's lair, but I now knew was just a normal little house. I drove out and onto the big motorway, reaching the city a while later. Slowly, the streets began to look familiar. I remembered the old play park, still the place where I could slide the best the metal slide smooth and polished from generations of kids. Across from it, there was our ball hockey court, where we played and practiced hundreds of hours and even had a few big games. And there were the soccer fields at my old school, which was once a lively place full of hide-and-seek and friendship and fun, though that was long gone. My mind wandered. I was so lost in thought that I didn't even notice, and before I knew it, I was pulling onto the street where I used to live. It was a long road, with a blind turn at the end. It was an old neighborhood, built in the pre-automobile days, with narrow roads that created a real sense of community, but also seemed to be stifling and claustrophobic, as the houses on either side of the road were so close together. I slowed down and looked at the houses as I drove by. It was an older suburb, so all the houses looked the same. I had a major chill as I suddenly noticed it at the same moment. The house. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the empty street, making it look lonely. I looked at the little house and wondered why it had seemed so eerie to me. I had originally planned on just driving up to the house and making sure it was a normal place, nothing supernatural or anything. But when I pulled up and put the car in park, I took a deep breath and got out before I even processed what I was doing. Walking over to the gate, a beautiful old metallic affair with intricate floral ironwork, painted a deep forest green, so badly rusted it was flaking off. I reached out and touched the bars, they were cold, and decided to try to open the gate. I just kept walking, 
was pretty surprised to see it was a big overgrown garden. Now that it was opened up, I could see that the lawn was actually pretty huge, no wonder it was so heavily overgrown. I shook my head and sighed at the apparent waste. No matter now, especially if the house was abandoned. I shivered involuntarily. I hated the feeling of being out in the middle of nowhere. You couldn't shake the feeling that anything or anyone could be lurking behind any tree or in the bushes. I chided myself mentally for being silly and paranoid and kept walking, repeating my usual mental exercise of relaxation until I felt better. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one, I reminded myself. My voice, though quiet, seemed to get swallowed up in the distance, and I glanced around at the huge lawn now visible before me. The sigh that escaped me seemed to melt into the space around me, and I shivered and kept going. I figured the house had been on the market for a while, given the economy and all. Maybe the owner hadn't heard the one about curb appeal. But driving around, I didn't see a for sale sign or a for rent or anything. Nobody seemed to be taking care of it. I could tell from the dirty windows at the front of the house from outside, it was still hard to see inside, but when I walked around back, the view was clearer. I was surprised by what I saw. There was a TV in the living room, though the screen was dusty. Magazines lay open on a coffee table. Upholstery and occasional furniture pieces were stacked about the rooms as though waiting to be used or put away, and out of a window, I saw a pair of coffee cups on the sill, with mold growing inside. The place sure looked like someone still lived there. There was just a thick layer of dust on everything and the occasional cobweb that made it look abandoned. If there were no dust, one would think the place was simply unoccupied. The house looked like it had been abandoned after a hasty exit. I couldn't see in the front windows from the outside, but when I circled to the back, I could. A TV in the living room was dust-covered. There were magazines on the coffee table. Inside, I could see that everything looked disorganized, with furniture and a sofa arranged as if it was either in use or had been stowed there temporarily. Two coffee cups sat on the windowsill, their insides filled with mold. It looked like the people who lived there had just up and left. Everything was in place, just covered in dust and some cobwebs. I made my way through the yard full of tall grass and hardy bushes to the back window. It looked the same as back in the day when I had lived there, but that was probably just the power of memory. I peered inside. The room was tiny, with not much space for variation. It looked like it was still the same as when I had lived there. There was a bed, a small dresser, and some toys scattered across the floor. I was angry for a moment, but I shook it off. I took a moment to look around the room. It had a child's nightlight, cheerful wallpaper peeling at the edges, toys on the floor, and a little bed. Could she really be right? Was I seriously considering the possibility that this giant being was chasing a little girl around this house with lecherous intent? I fell to the ground, exhausted, but yelled up to the two officers to please move to the neighbor's house and check outside. A few dark thoughts flitted through my head. I would never be able to live with myself if I didn't investigate, and it turned out that I could have stopped a rape from happening. I looked at the wall and thought I saw the blanket on the bed barely move an inch. I also thought I heard a wheezing cough outside the window. I blinked a few times and just repeated my usual science-based mantra in my head, deeply hoping for a more innocuous explanation. Still staring at the wall, I turned towards the bed. It looked like the corner of the blanket was now folded over a single inch. At the same time, I heard a cough tick. It sounded like someone was coughing in the next room over, out of window range, but not breathing hard or anything. I closed my eyes and repeated my mindless science-based logic, waiting inwardly for an outcome that never wavered. Science does not owe its debts to fancy. I opened my eyes and saw that there wasn't anything in the room. No ghosts or apparitions, just the bedroom with its simple furniture and the early morning light coming in through the window. I took a deep breath and felt better, blinking for the first time in a few days, thinking that maybe everything was all right after all. The sun was almost down, and I wanted to be home before dark. I felt a sudden rush of confidence, 
completely unlike earlier, and at the same time, I remembered I needed to do one more thing before I left the house, our house. I had left in such a hurry. As a child, I found it all so confusing and scary, but now that I was older and had stopped being afraid, I was just curious to see something. Down in the garden, there was a giant sycamore tree with massive roots that spread out in every direction and seemed older even than the house. The sunlight was just touching the top branches as I looked, and I was impressed by how little it had changed. I was growing older, going to school and traveling the world, yet the same old sycamore tree was down in the garden, offering me a friendly wave. I guess every kid needs a secret spot to hide their stuff. It's part of growing up. For me, that place was halfway up the old sycamore tree. I would have been a sight to see, but I climbed that tree so fast my parents never had to worry. The layout had changed a bit over time, but my memories of the tree and the way I used to climb around in it had always been accurate. I got about halfway up and stopped for a moment, taking a big breath of fresh air and grinning. I was alone, just me and the big old sycamore that had always stood in the same spot. It had a big space in the middle where the trunk had hollowed out. I had no idea why, maybe from animals or from a storm a long time ago, maybe lightning hit a branch. I had always used it as a secret hiding place for things I found that I wasn't supposed to have. If I found something at work and it got taken away from me, I'd squirrel it away in there and fetch it later. It wasn't that fascinating, just a stash of toys from when I was a baby and the occasional slightly more interesting item, like a dangerous slingshot or fireworks. I had no need to hide these things, but the younger me thought it was cool to be all sneaky and pretend to be a secret agent. The gully was dark and smelled of old, decaying leaves, and felt damp, but I reached inside to see what I could find anyway. I was amazed to find one of my toys that I had stashed away before we moved, years ago. I knew the feel of the plastic in my hand, and there was old, sharp edges, but the leaves and the darkness of the gully made it hard to see as I tried to pull it out from the thick, wet pile of decaying plant matter and old rainwater. It seemed to be tangled on some small, dry twigs. The windfall I was feeling was due to the fact that when we moved a few years earlier, I had left behind a tiny toy British soldier from the First World War. It was a small plastic thing, one of those finely molded toys that come with paint already applied, about an inch tall. Trivial as it sounds, it held a lot of sentimental value to me as it was my connection to the fascinating stories of my grandfather's heroism that I grew up with, apparently quite the character with mythical tales from both world wars. Although he died before I was born, I turned him into a caricature and acted out wildly exaggerated versions of his tales, using the little figure. I had chosen what I thought was an ideal hiding spot for him, no doubt where he would be secure and away from prying eyes. My excitement quickly turned to horror, I felt sick as I pulled out the figure and saw it was not my toy, but a dead animal skeleton, jammed in above the muck where I was supposed to have found my toy. I took it in my hands and accidentally crumbled some of the brittle bones, feeling them snap. Small clumps of fur and bits of rotted flesh rubbed off on my fingers. The balance I had managed to maintain before felt as though was beginning to slip away as I took in the acrid smell and gagged. I sighed and climbed down the tree slowly, trying not to jostle my way through. There was no treasure after all. My toy had most likely been found by another child and taken home with them in the intervening years. Outside in the garden, I gently buried the animal's remains, covering it with earth. I took a deep breath and climbed down from the tree, making sure not to break too many branches on my way down. I realized the treasure wasn't there. Someone had just picked up my toy, and it was either a neighbor or just another kid that had been there and gone in the years since. When I reached the ground in the backyard, I buried the animal in the garden and left. Despite what happened to me in the hollow, I felt pretty good about myself. I was proud that I was able to go back and have a look at it for myself, to prove to myself that I wasn't completely insane. At this point, I was happy with just a regular, boring explanation for things. I said goodbye to the old neighborhood, ready to be done with it. I drove back to my place and got on the freeway heading back to my place. After a while I started to think I was seeing things, just my imagination. 
but by the time the sun had set completely, I knew there was something there, something to it anyway, something that didn't seem to make sense but had come to mind for no reason, and so I needed to follow through on it, seeming as how there was nothing to lose. I drove home as fast as I could down the freeway. The sun had gone down completely, and I had to do a double take a few times on what were once familiar sights. The shadows played tricks on me, or maybe I just misinterpreted. What other explanation justified this unshakable feeling? It was just intuition whispering in my ear, nothing to lose by following it to the conclusion. I sped up, driving past the slower traffic on the freeway. I glanced back in the rearview mirror to check if I could see any headlights behind me. I kept driving in the cool evening, using the road lines to stay on course. I had to get home, fast. I gave it some more gas and looked in the rearview mirror as if I were in a race, 70, 80, 100 miles per hour. I gunned it down the road, honking and screaming out the window with sweat pouring down my face. What the hell was I doing? Please, just let me go home. I clutched the steering wheel and got off the highway onto the smaller local country roads that would take me directly to my hometown. These narrow, winding roads traversed a landscape that had become nothing but shadows in the twilight of night. The surrounding countryside seemed to press close, its general shape barely discernible in the darkness. I turned on my high beams to illuminate the road ahead and felt a rush of relief. The overwhelming anxiety that had clutched at my chest on the highway lessened, though it did not fully release. I nonetheless found myself frequently checking the rearview mirror to make sure there was no one behind me. It was crazy. I mean, I'm just trying to get information about a van I'm driving. How could I be driving down the highway and having someone chase me? It was irresponsible to think I could continue driving in traffic and put myself and others in danger because of her unfounded fears. Yeah, I know. Even still, I had to leave so fast. I'd been able to calm down and think things over a bit since then, but the long drive back was only making me wish I was home even more, in my own bed. I hurried home and pulled into my driveway, breathing a sigh of relief when I saw I had gone the right way. I turned off the car and sat there for a moment, before deciding I had to get over this whole thing. People not popping out of walls, creepy things watching you sleep, not walking up and peering in someone's window. I was losing it. I was completely and utterly losing it. Tomorrow, I would start fresh, abandoning the notebooks that contained my early childhood experiences, even stopping the sessions that covered nights I remembered as being particularly ominous. I'd go back to work as normal, spend time with my girlfriend, and generally look forward to getting back to the mundane pleasures of a routine that didn't involve doubting my sanity or believing in the irrational. As I tried to go back to living my normal daily life and pretend everything was fine, the thing in the back seat leaned in closer. It grabbed my shoulder harder and started to rub it in circles. It breathed out a big, gross breath directly down my neck. I ran over to the door, looking for the lock. I was suddenly very scared. I recognized the feeling from my childhood. It was the same fear that used to keep me up nights in my disgusting bedroom. The car's interior was now cold, but that hardly mattered compared to the sensation of icy fingers digging into my shoulder. I seriously thought I was going to die, that this fucking thing was going to get me after chasing me for so long. I put my hand on the door handle, gave it a little tug, and it opened. I fell out of the driver's seat sucking wind, onto the pavement below. For a moment, it felt like I saw someone in the back seat reflection, an old man with a wide grin on his face. It was dead quiet out, and I was glad no one was around to see me do this and think I was nuts. Looking back in the back, I didn't see anything. I took the keys out of the ignition and kicked the door shut, just to be sure. I stumbled up the front walk and made my way inside my house. Not going to lie, I got drunk and went to bed last night. Like I said, I do have some tangible evidence to show you. I pointed to the strange welts on my shoulder and the marks on the outside of the window, which I could clearly see had been jimmied open with some kind of tool or pry bar. Both did little to make me feel any better about the coming nights, though. I finished my report by telling him what I awoke to that morning. Sometimes the simplest messages are the most horrifying. 
I woke up to sunlight coming through the window and had a feeling in the pit of my stomach. I looked down to find a little toy soldier sitting on my chest, and I had to groan and shake my head a few times to make sure I was awake. It was the same one I had hidden away in the doorframe all those years ago as a kid, now returned to me, the plastic body gruesomely snapped in half. Last night was the scariest experience of my life, I was so traumatized. I'm sure by now you know about my visit to my childhood home and all the creepy stuff that happened there. Well, nothing I experienced as a child could have prepared me for last night. When I woke up and saw the broken toy soldier, I checked and saw that the window in my bedroom was open slightly, letting in a cold breeze. When I went to check it out, I saw that the window had been forced from the outside, the latches damaged and bent from being pushed open so hard. I could see from where I was that the window frame had three marks on it where someone had pried it open. They were strange in their shape, not the usual round dents that a crowbar or the like would leave, but more like if someone ran a jagged broken blade along the wood. The window wasn't broken, but there were three noticeable pry marks on the window. I tried to tell myself they looked like a crowbar or something. No big deal. I didn't understand how the toy soldier could have possibly ended up back in the toy section. I didn't like to think about it. I knew it was a message, but personally, I thought it was a sick joke from my childhood bully as opposed to an actual riddle to be solved. After spending the morning checking every room in my house, I made sure I hadn't lost anything, and it all appeared to be there. I could only hope whatever had been in the back of my car the night before had just wanted to scare me one last time before moving on. I looked all around my house that morning, and everything was still there, no break-ins. All my stuff was accounted for. I could only hope that last night someone had sat down in the back seat of my car, opened the door and unlocked it, and that was it. They were just trying to mess with me by that point. Maybe whatever it was would blow over given time away from my parents' house, where I had first developed my fear of spooky things. I got up and checked the house over to see everything was okay. Everything looked fine. The morning was so calm and peaceful, but my heart was heavy. I couldn't believe that someone had broken into my car the night before and had locked it back up. I tried to lighten the situation somewhat by suggesting someone had slipped in the back seat on me last night when I was putting the grocery bags in the trunk and unlocked it from the inside as a joke. I just hoped there hadn't been anything valuable in there, and same with the house. At least it had been my toy that was broken into, hey? I allowed myself the indulgence of a moment's wishful thinking that I could write it off as some child's prank rather than be forced to acknowledge the alternative and went back to the kitchen. I went out to the corner where I had seen something on the ground and picked it up. It was a piece of the beak of my toy. I decided that any mystery would have to wait for another day, and probably only one more day at that. You could put your finger on it. I took the bread out of the fridge and set it on the counter. I changed the coffee filter and refilled the water. If someone reads about a fire in your parents' house, I reflected, but then shook my head disgustedly at myself for stooping to that level. Who cares, honestly? I had better things to focus on. It wasn't that I believed the owner of the security company might call me with details of the break-in either. I just couldn't help but doubt him. I cleared the counter and went to collect my paper from the mailbox. It was a beautiful morning. I decided to take it and sit on the deck with my coffee instead of behind the small TV tray in the kitchen as I usually did. So I steeled my nerves and stiffened my resolve. I hoped for a better day. I was sure that things would seem clearer in the light. I was never good at thinking in the dark. As the sun went down and it got darker, I started to think about my childhood fear of bedtime and the anticipation of going to sleep, hoping morning would come quickly, but dreading the night ahead. Whenever I had that fear, it always seemed to get stronger at sunrise after I had been up all night thinking about it. And please understand, this was not just because I had been worried about my own neck before. When I was a kid, I had been convinced that the vampire that visited me in my sleep was only interested in me, so I never worried about my family. However, it seemed things had changed, and now I felt differently. Now I was worried, 
a thick heaviness of worry. I was afraid for my family, you see, because I wasn't the only one in this house. Two years ago, my girlfriend and I moved in together. I did annoy her enough to not be able to call her by her name after that, so let's call her Mary. Mary and I were supposed to be getting engaged this Christmas. Everything was going so good. Now our whole future has been thrown into question, all because of the disgusting fecal mutant. I knew Mary would be back tonight. She was on one of her cross-country trips doing events and promotions. It was not unusual for her to be gone a few days at a time. I never complained, and she never expected me to. We both knew I was an introvert and occasionally needed a few days alone to get some writing done. Still, I missed her, and after the events of the past week, I was missing her more than ever. She got there at 6 p.m., and I greeted her with a smile, a hug, and a kiss. I tried to pretend everything was fine, but Mary, who knew me as well as anybody, clearly noticed and asked what was wrong. She arrived at 6 p.m. on the dot, and I greeted her with a smile, a hug, and a peck on the cheek. Despite my best efforts to hide it, Mary could tell I was a little out of sorts and asked, What's wrong? I told Mary I had written a story about when I was a kid, and going over it had left me pretty upset. She put her suitcase and bags down and sat down on the couch, motioning for me to do the same with a kind smile, soothingly telling me to take a deep breath and relax, and begin from the start. I told Mary I had written a story about when I was a kid, and it made me feel really anxious thinking about it. She put down her suitcase and bags and sat down on the couch, patting the seat next to her. She told me to take a deep breath, calm down, and start from the beginning but I couldn't. I can't believe I didn't tell her about that thing, that horrible thing that got into the house, some alien or monster. I think I must have let it in with my stupid questions. I didn't want her to think I was crazy at the time, but in retrospect I wish I had told her everything. I think one of the worst things you can do in a relationship is not tell the truth. Second only to that is telling a half-truth though, because you're not just lying, you're selectively telling the truth to fit your narrative. I told her about my half-truth, using all the right words, but neglecting a few key details. Keeping my voice casual, I told her the basic gist of what happened, leaving out the room and the shadowy figure at the foot of my bed. That was where I was lying. The window's latch had been compromised from the outside, and there were deep scratches in the wood, as if someone had been frantically attempting to claw their way inside once again. I fully expected her to discover these things eventually, as well as the unlockable window. I was just telling a little white lie, I said, addressing her calm interest, not unkindly. It had been a terrifying childhood nightmare, I'd left some of that part out. I made up an elaborate story about how I'd woken up one night to someone trying to break in, so I had chased them off. I made up a story for her, and she believed it, felt sorry for me and everything. Looking at it now, I just feel bad I was lying. I should have been honest with you, maybe we could have worked out something together. Instead, I just made things worse and broke our friendship. What happened last night ruined something I really care about. The sun went down and it got dark, and I had to lay down and go to sleep. I expected to lie there awake in the dark for a while. Mary's soft snoring was comforting. I never slept well during my usual check. I knew that the thing would soon show up and curse at me. It seemed as though it needed to build up a certain strength over time and could only take so much from me per week or month. I got settled into bed, anticipating a long night ahead as usual. Mary's snoring was a comfort as I knew the checks wouldn't wake me. I found I had to remain alert in any case. I needed to be ready for the entity suddenly acting up and launching into one of her long, vitriolic rants. Thank God I didn't sleep as much as I used to in university, back home for the summer, or I'd be screwed. My body, I supposed, knew what it needed well enough. By 4 a.m. I was slipping under, deflating into the mattress and shedding my anxiety for a blissful night's sleep. Sleep is usually not an impervious force. As I was dozing off, I thought I felt something at the edge of my consciousness. I opened my eyes and let them adjust to the darkness of the room for a moment. 
Mary was sound asleep next to me still, breathing evenly. Her breathing was even and steady. It was helping calm me down. But no, it was still there, I realized. The sound was faint, like it was coming from behind something. I paused and listened, trying to discern it, but nothing else came, so I stayed in bed for another few minutes, my ears straining. I no longer felt tired enough to sleep and was getting frustrated so I got up and went to see what was making the noise. I sat up and listened carefully, finding it quite strange. A soft, low hum, nothing I had ever heard before. I strained my ears and eventually was able to make out what it was, though it was muffling the sound quite considerably. It was like a loud, staticky repeat. When I was a kid, my grandmother was in a nursing home, and I remembered seeing something similar there. The sight of elderly patients who were afflicted with dementia would randomly wander the grounds, talking to themselves. They repeated the same nonsense phrases and words in a loop, like they often did. It sounded like the same kind of repetitive muttering that I was hearing right now. This is what I thought of. Someone not making any sense, like they were confused or delirious. Somewhere, in the back of my head, I could hear the voice of my grandmother's dementia from when I was a child visiting her in the nursing home. It was like I could just barely hear the spoken words of misremembered memories and thoughts that couldn't find their way to the surface. I'm not able to do that. I glanced around, but it all looked normal. My mind wandered back to a sleepover at a friend's house when I was a kid in the same kind of room, with the same hidden, looming threats. I took a step forward, and the sound got louder. I still couldn't make out what the person was saying, but I was getting a good idea of what they sounded like. It was an old man, with a really rough, gravelly voice that sounded like he had smoked a lot. The man I heard was saying was now saying it faster and faster, like a mantra, but it sounded muffled, like he was behind a curtain or something. I was really scared, but knowing Mary was in the other room made me feel a lot better, and so I took a deep breath and inched another step forward, barefoot. Once again the voice seemed to get louder as I made my way over. I wasn't sure if it was my imagination or not, but I could have sworn I was hearing it yell my name more urgently as I got closer. The next step I took almost made me fall over. The murmurs had been a mess of nonsensical gibberish, and now they were forming a clear sentence. And within that, I could make out a single word. Just one. But it was enough to make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It pronounced my name differently. Oh great, it knows my name now. To me, it seemed like that meant it could go anywhere and come get me, whenever it wanted. I shivered and considered how it could, at any minute, just kill me, so easily. Hey, I think I just saw something over there, I said. I had also noticed the man thrashing around. I brought in focus just in time to see the woman's lips moving. I had no idea who she was. She had to be right there. I realized where I was and took a deep breath, the wind rustling the trees. The man looked distressed, his movements erratic. I looked back at the woman, who was moving her lips like she was talking. I didn't know who she was, but she was obviously standing right there, in the flesh. Hiding behind the shut curtains, I like putting my face into them because they're so soft. The moon was out, and although it was not able to shine through the heavy fabric of the curtains, I could see the thing sitting by my window now, out of the corner of my eye. I don't know what came over me, but I was more alarmed than I had been, and felt that I had to do something. Feeling weird but not creepy, I turned around to look out the window, but saw nothing there. I kept looking. I thought I had seen something. My subconscious told me I should check it out. I took another step toward the drapes. They were moving slightly, although it was hard to tell if it was my doing or if there was really someone behind them. I was close enough now that I could hear the person's breathing. It was harsh and ragged, with the signs of someone with a serious upper respiratory condition, and I could hear mucus in their lungs, causing a gurgling noise with every breath. With anticipation, I walked up to the room and looked at the drapes. At first it almost looked like they were moving, but I wasn't sure if it was just because I had gotten closer. 
They were now inside touching distance. I could clearly hear the person behind the drapes now, as they wheezed and panted and coughed, uncontrollable, thickly. Determined, I was about to confront this ugly reminder from my past, the child abuser. As I put my hand up to touch the curtain, my fingers brushed against it, and the heavy fabric undulated slightly, causing the panels to separate for a moment. I thought I saw the guy inside for a brief moment. My lord, I... I can't even... It was twitching and shaking, still muttering to itself in some made-up language. Its skin was stretched tight across protruding bones, spine and ribs and bulging internal organs clearly visible. It looked like a starvation case in its abdomen, but was otherwise a physical threat, despite evidence to the contrary, obviously having a history of unknown aggression and potential for violent outbursts. I felt sick, and the smell was awful. In the total blackness, I heard someone speaking, although his voice seemed distorted, like his teeth were all broken. I tried to feel sorry for the guy. He looked emaciated, like he was constantly hungry. I snapped out of it and realized this person was not someone to be pitied. He was not a person to be diagnosed and studied, and he was not shaking because he was cold, but because he was shaking with excitement. Standing there, thinking I was wrong and checking between the curtains to make sure it wasn't actually the stray. I took a deep breath and pulled the curtain back out, ready to face the truth and my vandal, the prowler. Just as I was pulling back the curtain again, I saw something, she said. I think he was trying to talk to me with his broken jaw. I think he was saying, help me. Look behind you, she said. I felt a cold breeze blow down my back. For a moment I stood there, but the power of love compelled me to act. If I had been alone, I would have panicked and run away, but with Mary right there fast asleep in the same room as that thing, I couldn't think of anything but keeping her safe. I turned around slowly, and there was the sound of loud wheezing, and the creature appeared to be taking loud, heaving breaths. By the time I had turned a quarter of the way around, I could smell its breath, it was rancid with the stench of death and decay, and I distinctively heard Mary scream. I turned around and looked at the horror. It wasn't behind me. It was on the bed. It was standing up and seemed to be laughing, sounding content. Its back was hunched and bony, barely covered by a sad old piece of fabric that might have once been a nightgown. But was this thing human? Had it been human? Or was it something so foul? so despicable, so utterly and completely contemptible that its nature defied description, remaining beyond the understanding of any man or woman's attempt to quantify or understand. Taking my chance, I lunged forward and started pulling, punching, and tugging on the big man with all my might. His skin, soft and sweaty or slimy, who knew, kept slipping through my fingers. He laughed and kept pushing pressure, gleefully smooshing Mary's face into her pillow and using his surprisingly long and flexible limbs to rip her nightdress off and grope her bare skin. Her muffled screams from under the pillow made my heart race. I started to worry she was going to suffocate. My voice rose in volume and urgency. I yelled. I begged argumentally. I told it to let her go, to do what it wanted to me but to let her go, but my pleas only seemed to spur it on, make it more excited. It was hurting her cutting her up, my Mary. Before long, the thing let go of Mary, but kept its hand, a huge, spindly, bony thing, on the back of her head, pressing her face down into her pillow. I was still trying to strangle the life out of it, my hands wrapped around its neck as hard as I could, but it didn't seem to be doing anything. Despite looking as weak as it did, the creature was obviously incredibly strong. I watched in shock as it ran its fingers through Mary's hair, each stroke slow and loving. I could hear the bones breaking, the cartilage popping, the tendons snapping. Relieved the screams weren't coming from Mary, I was soon hanging on the creature's back, one arm wrapped tightly around its neck as my chin rubbed against the rough, sandpaper-like skin of its shoulder. The creature's spiny back jabbed into my stomach as it turned its head in a way that no human could, and its neck made disturbing cracking sounds every time it moved, as if it had arthritis or rigor mortis. Thankfully, it wasn't Mary. I had a death grip on the thing's back, 
my arm around its neck. My chin scraped the rough hide with each step. The spines on the thing's back stabbed painfully into my stomach as it moved. Its head swiveled completely around, noisily cracking like arthritic bones or rigor mortis stiff ones. It looked at me. I guess that whole thing about not seeing the forest for the trees is true. I was so fixated on the creature that I didn't notice what the surroundings looked like. I held her tighter and swore loudly, yelling as loud as I could. If I could, I would have strangled it, but it didn't look like I was going to get the chance. The thing was still absent-mindedly running its hands through Mary's hair and looking at me with bored disinterest. Holding Mary close, I screamed and yelled, cursing under my breath. If I could have, I think I would have killed the thing. It seemed to not care, though, stroking Mary's hair absent-mindedly and looking at me with a blank expression. I will never forget the sound it made when it tried to smile at me. It sounded like an evil mustached villain from a cartoon movie, puffing out his cheeks and making a high-pitched fake guffaw. As it touched my face, I felt how cool its skin was as its eyes looked deeply into mine. They were completely black, like pools of shadow. I couldn't see my own reflection in there. It was almost like peering into two bottomless pits that held no light or happiness, or love. It looked directly at me like it was trying to tell me something, like it had a simple idea to convey, but I just wasn't getting it. It was almost like it was frustrated with me. The creature's hateful presence seemed to hover in the still air. It reached out and touched my face, with both hands this time, harder and slower. Its eyes continued to stare at me. It was trying to tell me something. I felt sure of it. There was only one simple message, conveyed visually, that I was not receiving. It was in front of me, getting frustrated, its breaths smoke rings in my face. With a jerk and a violent yank, the creature pulled out a handful of Mary's hair and then disappeared. She didn't even scream, just made a soft noise of pain. I switched on the bedside light so the room wasn't in total darkness for her, but didn't say anything. She cried. I unstrapped her from the board and held her until the ambulance came. I looked into her eyes while this was happening, and I knew what she was thinking. She thought I was her attacker, the guy who had been doing all those horrible things to her. I had endured so many terrible things, but that expression of betrayal and disgust is about the most painful thing I can remember seeing. She's gone. She took a deep breath and left after packing up a few personal items. I tried to explain it as best I could, but she wasn't having it. Who would believe such a story? She told me she was leaving and wouldn't be contacting the police, but if I called her, she would. It had been my fault she was upset, after all. She stopped walking partway out of the building and started to cry. I am starting to think that she is gone for good. The woman who I love more than anything else in the world now thinks that I am a violent monster. I only wish she knew the truth, knew what had really happened, knew that the thing causing all the damage that day had nothing to do with what had been a person at some point in the distant past. It was 5 a.m. when Mary left me. Now it's 9 a.m. I am sitting here at my kitchen table, writing this down so that there is a record, so that people might understand, so that Mary will know it wasn't my fault, no matter what happens. It was 5 a.m. when Mary left, now 9 a.m. I am sitting at my kitchen table, writing this out for the record, so other people will know what happened, and Mary can know what's going to come, and that it wasn't my fault. With that finished, I see it is time to put sentimentality aside. I will only allow myself a small window to mourn Mary and panic. I have to keep moving. I hear my neighbor's kids laughing and playing outside. Their joy is infectious. I think about my own memories of being that happy and carefree when life was as simple as playing with friends on a sunny day, climbing a big tree, or getting to kiss your girlfriend under the stars. Or just going to bed at night knowing you're going to have good dreams because you're falling asleep in a happy home. There was never a different way for me to grow up, I guess. This, this thing has broken me. But not completely. Whatever it wants to do to me, I won't let it hurt anybody else. Of that, I am certain.
The sun is getting lower in the sky as I get ready to go. The neighbor's kids are still running around and playing. I don't have a lot of time. There's a whole host of things I need to get done before it gets dark and before he comes back. I have a good plan, a bit of luck, and we may just be all right. I doubt I'll see you again soon. I have important work to do. I hope you understand how crucial it is. I got the feeling the sun was starting to go down. The kids next door were running about, screaming and laughing. I needed to quickly tidy up a few things before dark so I could make sure I was ready for his return. I thought it would be best to be prepared because I had a plan and I felt optimistic enough that we might not see each other again for a long time. I had a lot of work to do after all. The moon was out. I was going to go finally confront my horrible neighbor. I put pen to paper and started writing. I had been let go by the authorities maybe an hour ago, but the crazy situation from the past day and night still felt so urgent, I just had to get it all down. Part of me wanted to forget the whole thing and never think about it again, but I knew I couldn't and shouldn't do that. It was a matter of self-preservation, and honestly, an important one. For the proper functioning of my own mind, I needed to at least attempt to explain what had happened. If I made it out again in life to live on the streets, I needed these notes to remind me that I was always better off just consumed in my own thoughts. After Mary left, I felt like I had let her slip away forever. But I didn't feel depressed. In fact, I felt really energized. I knew what I had to do. I had to kill the thing. Just to be safe, for my own peace of mind, and out of duty and conscience, duty to myself, to others I cared about, and also to any other little children out there who might be prey to its predations. I mean, like, I knew I was going to be dead soon, but I really didn't have anything left to lose at that point. They say revenge is a dish best served cold, and although I had spent my entire adult life wishing I could make that monster go away, the thought of actually getting rid of it made me smile. That night it was so happening, I was going to kill it, by my own hands if I had to, even if I had to haul it down the hike by myself. I spent the next couple hours getting ready, packing my backpack with the essentials. I sat at the kitchen table and wrote a letter to Mary and my family, explaining what had happened and telling them it was not their fault. I called my mom, then my dad, then my brother and spoke with them, telling them I loved them and saying goodbye. My mother asked if I was okay, and I told her I was fine, not untruthfully, before I hung up. Around seven, I walked out to the car. By then, the sun was down and the street was quiet. I got in the car and leaned back in the driver's seat. The door across from me stood open, waiting. By nine o'clock, nothing had changed. The shop was still empty, and it was pretty chilly sitting by the open door. As I sat there thinking to myself, I came to a realization. I started thinking about what had happened with the old man's body. One question popped into my head, which I couldn't get out. By nine o'clock the shop was empty, and the warm day had turned cold with the open door. I was sitting there thinking to myself, and a thought occurred to me. I recalled the death I had attended a few days earlier, specifically the old man. I sat there for a moment and thought hard. I was bothered by one particular question. Can you put out someone who's already dead? By nine, the shop was empty and quite cold, so I went outside to enjoy a beer. I was sitting alone in silence when I thought of the old man I had seen a few days earlier and pondered my next steps in dealing with his car. It took under a minute for me to decide when I felt a slight change in the car's suspension from something inside it not outside, like the wind. Normally I wouldn't pay any attention at all, but it reminded me of when I was a kid and the bunk bed would creak as the thing climbed into the bottom bunk. I knew the sensation very well. I thought I may have smelled something too. On the air, the silently decomposing body in the car's trunk had changed the atmosphere a little. The presence was in my car with me, it had to have been, but I just hadn't seen anyone. Hadn't seen anyone in the back seat. I thought I heard something whispering. I went and shut the passenger door firmly, then friskily grilled the driver's side, then got in and started the car, 
pulling away. How could it know what I was planning to do with it? Our target was fairly close, but we had to travel over hills and valleys to get there. It wasn't long before I could have sworn I heard something behind us, but I didn't turn around. I'd get to deal with him eventually. The irony struck me hard. Here I was, worrying about scaring away the same thing that used to scare the hell out of me and give me nightmares as a kid. I drove carefully through the country roads in the dark and hoped my passenger wouldn't notice the difference in my demeanor. I got there and turned off the car. It was so ironic. I parked, and a few seconds later, on the deserted rural road, the parking lot in front of us was full. I rolled down the window and took a deep breath of the fresh country air. I hoped there would not be any noticeable change in my scent. The car was having trouble getting through the thick underbrush as I drove it off the road and into the woods. The scene had opened up before me. At least a dozen trees were down, and I could see right to them. They appeared to be dead and had been for some time. The moon was high in the sky, stars twinkling, and I felt the cold night air through the open window. It was a bleak picture. At least I was going out to clear the world of the most dismal thing in it. The stop came up suddenly, and the terrain changed. An old quarry had left a cliff face looking down at the lake below. The cliff was relatively flat, because it used to be a road before it collapsed. The cliff had a history of being unstable and was still consolidating after a major rock slide a couple of years back. It was also a local attraction for daring kids, as there were many rumors of people who had driven off the road and fallen into the lake, or of workers who had died when the quarry had collapsed. Or maybe they weren't just rumors. In this day and age, I would have just dismissed these myths as urban legends. But now, after my recent experiences, I had to wonder who would ever believe Ryan if he told people the things he had seen. I turned the car off and parked a few meters away from the unstable edge of the cliff, being sure to snuff out all the lights and taking a few minutes to collect myself before starting in on the situation. The time passed slowly as I sat in the car, just listening to the waves hit the rocks below. When the truck shut off, I sat and waited for a minute letting the engine cool down before getting out. I could hear the ocean waves in the distance, breaking against the rocks. The creature was smart, had seemed to be enjoying itself, and liked playing with its food. I was aware it would be suspicious of my car approaching too close to it and might take off. I needed to be a passive target and let it attack me. Let it feed, I thought, then just move the car slowly toward the edge while it was down there. The thing was just playing mind games. It was smart enough to catch on if I got too close too quickly and might run back into the water or down the trail. So I would have to let it attack the car, let it get to munching it before I would be able to move the car closer to the edge. I was determined that thing was going to drown. I had thought about it and figured there'd be a split second when I could grab Mary and jump out before the car went over. She and I used to come out here to get away from everything during our first summer together, and I figured it was worth a shot. I knew the terrain well enough, I'd say the drop was a good 30 feet down to the water. I didn't relish the idea of being in a car that crashed into the water, or even worse, being trapped in the car with Bobby. I made up my mind, and looked. It was the longest idol in the world, everyone's imagination clashing with their memories of summers at the resort surrounded by trees and the wild scent of the outdoors. I knew the area well, and also where to jump into the water below. No thanks. I didn't want to feel the impact of crashing into the water or, worse still, end up trapped in there with Bobby. Then I heard it. First very softly, but it quickly grew louder and faster and louder, and sounded just like someone was wheezing behind me. Strangely even louder, and breathing so painfully heavily and thickly, it sounded as if their lungs were filled with fluid and decay, and a noxious odor filled the air around me, making me gag. The sound of the breathing behind me was getting louder, faster. It was starting to sound more like someone who was in trouble, who was having trouble breathing. Each breath was a gurgling wheeze, wet and labored, like they were drowning in their own fluids. It was also making a terrible smell. I had to stop myself from gagging. 
My heart leapt into my throat as I looked up and saw the windshield of the car frosting up from the inside. I saw my breath was steaming, which made sense, I guess, but it looked like it was being blown sideways across my face, despite the lack of wind. I shook my head, fighting back tears. I had to stay here, had to keep the thing from getting away. Sitting next to me, it just sat there. I looked from the window at the snow, to my breath, which was visible but blowing sideways across my face, I bit back my tears and reminded myself to keep watching it to make sure it didn't run away. I couldn't stop looking at it, and it didn't stop looking at me. It was bent over and thin, like really emaciated, and pulling at its hands like someone with rigor mortis. It started to walk towards me, really slowly, groaning and creaking the whole way. I shuddered as one bony leg stepped over my lap and swung down past. Oh no, what had I done? The figure came up close to me, I could see its face, how its skin hung off its sharp cheekbones, and its eyes were wide and smiling. Its teeth were bared due to its rotting smile, showing off chunks of enamel and half-attached tendons. It came closer and opened its mouth. I could see its tongue glistening and covered in goo through its partially toothless maw. It took a deep breath, and I could smell its foul breath, and taste it in the back of my throat, causing me to gag and retch, my eyes watering. It paused in enjoying my distress, and then let out a vindictive cackle. Looking into its eyes, it bizarrely seemed to be the struggling, frail old man it had begun to appear to be, still very strong, but noticeably slowing down. Maybe it had something to do with it being in that long, dimly lit room all the time, though. With the lack of fresh air, I mean. It just didn't seem as bad around it now that it was out in the hall. Its long, twisted fingers brushed against my cheek and then stabbed into my shoulder, making me scream as it twisted its hand around in my flesh to cause maximum pain and damage. Its other hand was sliding down towards my waist. Its icy, bony fingers slapped me in the face and then jammed deep into my shoulder, causing me to scream as it twisted its arm around to inflict more pain and serious injury. Its other hand was reaching around my waist. The big moment came. I managed to use the arm the ghost wasn't holding and turned the key in the ignition. Just in time, ignoring the pain from my still-pinned shoulder, I threw the car into gear and pulled away as fast as I could. The thing screeched and thrashed, trying to climb over me into the back seat, but I held on tight, thinking of Mary, and the car was getting close to the edge. I looked at the driver's door and made a split-second decision. I screamed at the thing as it reared back, punching me in the face. I saw it up close now, its grotesque, rotting features. I pushed back, hard as I could, and managed to shove it off me. It jumped into the back seat as I did. I unlocked the car door as fast as I could, trying to keep my hands from shaking. I didn't have time to react. The car went over the edge. I saw the car speeding past the bumpy cliff face, and then we hit the water and crashed down through the surface. The airbags deployed fortunately, so I wasn't killed instantly, but my head whipped to the side and I hit it on the doorframe. I shook my head and looked around. The sound from the thing in the water was garbled, but I thought I recognized it. It had been high and squeaky at first, like a baby, but it had gradually deepened until it sounded like a deep voice with a centuries-old intelligence behind it. It seemed to know it was in danger. The water, freed from the crumpled car door, which had been opened by the impact, rushed in and hit me so hard I had the wind knocked out of me, just as it was doing to the poor animal that had been in the car. She was panicked, squirming and looking for a way out. She looked totally freaked out and headed straight for the open car door, swimming towards me. Closing my hand into a fist, I drew back and punched the zombie in the face. Bits of rotted flesh flew off of it, and a dark black fluid began to drip from the new wound, in contrast to the murky water around us. Feeling the icy cold water climb up to my chin, I knew that if I could just hold the thing under the water for a few minutes in the car, I would be okay. My heart racing, I took a deep breath, and with a sudden, final surge, I jumped in and plunged under the surface. Holding my breath, I steeled myself for what I figured was certain death hoping it wouldn't be too cold or painful. 
I thought of Mary and my family, a deep wave of sadness crashing over me. Then, struggling with the werewolf that was trying to get past me and into the room, thrashing wildly, actually I thought I saw something. The werewolf's leg was caught between the dashboard and the car floor. As I expected from such a long fall, it still had the strength to wobble and squirm, but it was stuck. It wasn't going to be able to get free from the wreckage. I swam for the door and could see about a foot in front of me in the black water. I turned to look and there was light coming from above. In no time I was at the door. The thing grabbed me and tried to pull me back and compel me to get it out, obviously not even bothering to try to help itself out at this point. It just wanted to pull me with it to my doom. It felt like forever down in that truck as it continued to sink, the air getting thinner and thinner. I could feel my fingers and toes now, and noticed that I'd better take a deep breath before going under. I was relieved and managed to get myself out of the truck, turning 180 degrees and pushing with my feet against the dash for leverage. I eventually managed to get out of the cab and scrambled down to the lake. I don't remember what I was thinking, or how my opponent ended up in the lake, but by the time I got there I remember it was lying on the ice, flailing its arms and legs. Trekking through the forest, I had to deal with the cold and being wet, but I made it. My shoulder throbbed in pain the whole way, making me have to slow down. I held my hand firmly to the injury, and since I had a two-hour hike back home, I made it while my legs and the biting cold that night didn't give me hypothermia. I was surprised when I recognized the houses on my street and felt a surge of adrenaline and pride. I was tired, but I had finally beaten the thing for good. Tired but happy after solving my case, I came home to find an odd surprise. There were big wet footprints leading from the front door to my bedroom. I couldn't believe it. It was just too much. I got back and it was lying in bed, silent, a sheet pulled up to its chin. It was pretty different from the last time I saw it when it was chasing after me, desiring physical contact. The trail of its wet footprints led straight to its open room where it was laying down peacefully. The human body is amazing when you think that you can't possibly keep going, that you're exhausted and can't handle any more stress, another idea forms. Just let it sit for now. I snuck around, feeling along the way until I found my wallet on the coffee table in my living room. I left the front door unsecured when I went out to the next appointment. When I got back, it was only gone an hour. I braced myself and went to the spare room for a new search, sitting on the freshly washed linens of the bed, hoping it wouldn't pick now to show up in these last few minutes. But this was it. This was the kicker. The moment after which there could be no further reasonable doubt. It had to show me what had allowed it to escape from the car and diverted its intended drowning in the lake. I just had to remain firm and not let it squirm away from me again. There was no way it was getting out of this room without me seeing it. I kept my eyes closed and pretended to be asleep. I fell asleep for real after a while. I woke up and it was choking me. I couldn't move. It was on top of me coughing and gagging, spitting black blood from its face wounds into my face. I needed to breathe and struggled for air, my thoughts consumed with trying to break free. But its hands were strong and my grip was slippery from its dip in the lake. I did the same thing, rubbed my eyes and pretended to faint so that I wouldn't see the big snake coming when it ate its own tail. I laid on the ground and didn't move, stiff. It began shaking me and gripping me around the neck then let go. I waited for the best time I could possibly get and positioned myself for the moment. It exhaled, and I saw its eyes flick to me, confused. I stood there, waiting for the guy to move so I could push the fridge off the edge. I stood waiting for the man to leave so I could push the fridge. Suddenly, the guy was standing right in front of me, leering and grinning his grin, clearly making fun of the fact that I was alive and he wasn't. He made a loud spitting sound and spat onto my face. A glob of brown fluid hit me in the face. I clenched my fists and fought the urge to scream or do anything to wipe off my skin where I had been touched, and waited. My opponent leaned in and put its hands on my shoulder, right on the open wound. I struggled against the pain. Then the monster put two of its fingers in my mouth. 
It tasted awful, like rotting garbage and happened to be dense and forceful, popping its knuckles and stretching its back while it did, causing me to involuntarily gag. Disgusted, I gagged. The monster's fingers felt gross, like wet garbage, pressing heavily down onto my tongue. I could hear its knuckles popping as it flexed its fingers, stretching its muscles. Instead of looking surprised, it laughed, putting its fingers further in my mouth. I felt the cold, hard flesh pressing against my throat, silently choking and wishing it would stop. In our darkest moments, we find out what we are capable of. I did a quick roll to the side and managed to tug myself free with some effort. I dropped to the floor. The thing grabbed at my feet but I kicked and yelled, freeing myself as it looked over at me. It stood up on the bed with an eerie agility, and its bones creaked as it assumed its full height, looking ready to pounce again. Ever since I was a little kid I had been scared all the time. It had taken my innocence, attacked Mary, and ruined my life. I couldn't take it anymore. My childhood had been messed up and traumatic, my innocence stolen, Mary assaulted, and my life ruined. I had made up my mind. Sometimes, the most dangerous animal to work with is the smart one, the one who can outthink you, the one who fools you into thinking they are not a threat, the one who has learned to dislike you. It had gotten itself caught in my traps, which I had made logically and scientifically. Fire cleanses all. As it groaned and twisted, getting ready to attack, I had a ready. I pulled a blanket off the bed and revealed a bucket I had filled with gas earlier. I quickly threw it over the creature and the bed as far as I could. The creature grinned at me, widening its lips in a cruel, mocking expression, as if to say, Look at the big baby. It hurt. I pulled out my lighter and flicked the wheel, a small flame appearing. Then I threw it at the thing. It screamed and squirmed, bits of it continuing to vanish and sizzle away completely. I watched as the small flame from my lighter lit the being on fire. Let it burn, I said, and watched its shape panic, scream, and squirm, the sound of itself crackling and hissing and letting off steam as it continued to evaporate and sizzle into nothing. The fire got big really fast, and someone called the fire department when they heard us yelling outside. I don't remember how I got out of the fire. After a few hours in the hospital getting treated for smoke inhalation and minor burns on my hands, I didn't even care I was in pain as I typed. Even though I partly am still, turns out superficial burns, so misleadingly named, heal pretty well. I'd have some permanent scars which I would just have to deal with. Soon after that, I was arrested and charged with suspicion of arson and murder. The police had noticed I was injured with a deep wound on my shoulder and scratches all over, and had cautioned me not to go too far as they'd be wanting to ask me more questions at some point, though I doubted it would do them any good. They had also not found any remains or other evidence indicating anyone else had been there except for a large silhouette burned into the mattress and the wall, as if someone had been pressing against it just before they had made it out. I feel so much better now. I've been carrying that weight since I was a kid and didn't even realize it. I feel like a new person. I'm devastated about Mary, and I think the house is a write-off. I'm pretty sure I'll be charged with arson once they figure out I'm the one who set it on fire, and that means there goes any chance of an insurance payout. My hands hurt, and my shoulder still doesn't feel great, but I feel pretty good overall. I'm writing this from a hotel room. Decent place, nothing fancy, but it will do for now. I think I'm going to try and get a good night's rest, and maybe I'll dream like I did when I was little, before all the bad stuff happened. I think it was my clear-headed rationality that helped me, my logical thinking, to fight such an unspeakable evil. Though I can't get over the feeling that there is a lot more to the world than we can see. It's not a place I want to find out much more about. I'm going to bed now, and tomorrow I will start to rebuild my life, knowing the ghost is gone for good. I have a feeling about it. Getting used to feeling safe will take some time, and I might still have illusions, ingrained habits from a lifetime of looking over my shoulder. Feeling safe was my next step. I wasn't going to be looking over my shoulder forever, although it's a habit now and will probably always be a part of my personality.
As I was lying in the hospital this morning, I felt the bed shake slightly. However, I knew I had imagined it. I'm glad I documented my journey. It's helped me understand a lot about myself. Self-reflection is important, and if something ever happened and someone else had to cope with the same thing, maybe these words will provide some guidance. Now it's time for bed. I'm tired as hell.